Good morning. We're going to get started with our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the Energy Resources Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And we facilitate the Rights of Way of Habitat Working Group, which is a forum for information exchange and best management practices um, that promote habitat on working landscapes, such as utility and transportation rights of way. If you're interested in learning more about the working group, um, as well as finding additional information on uh, habitat conservation efforts, again, best management practices, planning tools, habitat in the news, um, any of those sorts of things, um, we have a newly um, updated website. You can see the URL link here. Um, so please visit, visit us there. Um, we will also be posting a recording of this webinar um, after a couple of days. Um, so you can find all that good information, again, on our website. As far as some logistics before we get started, um, if you are attending um, the webinar, um, you are in um, a listen-only mode or muted, um, just given the size of the audience today. So if you have a question or you're having any sort of technical difficulties, um, please chat those to us in the chat box, um, and we'll respond as quickly as we can. As far as questions for the presenters, um, we've saved some time at the end of the presentation um, to address those. So over the course of the presentation, feel free to again chat any questions related to um, the presentations also into that chat box. Um, and again, we'll save some time at the end um, to go through those. So with that, uh, let's turn to our topic for today. We're presenting three perspectives on mowing practices and how they impact monarch butterflies in their habitat particularly on um, roadside rights of way. Our presenters are shown here um, in the order of their presentations. And let me briefly introduce them. First, we have Edward Insminger, who is a research associate in the Department of Sustainable Bioproducts and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center at Mississippi State University. He's a wildlife and fisheries biologist, as well as a general ecologist. And he's studied prairies, reclamation sites, wetlands, mowing on roadside rights of way and in forested environments, researching vegetation and habitat structure for various fish and wildlife species. Next, we have Stephanie Dobbs, who's roadside maintenance manager for the Illinois Department of Transportation. She's responsible for oversight of 330,000 acres of right of way vegetation management statewide in Illinois. She's the chair of the Operations Pollinator Task Force co-chair and founder of Illinois DOT's Rights of Way as Habitat Committee, and leader of Illinois DOT's Operation Habitat Campaign. Stephanie is a right of way sector group leader with the Illinois Monarch Project, and is a member of the Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy um, for the Right of Way Technical Work Group. Additionally, Stephanie oversees 33 interstate rest areas across the nine districts statewide. And then thirdly, we have Doug Landis, who joined the Department of Entomology at Michigan State University in 1988. And he is currently a university distinguished professor with research and teaching responsibilities in insect ecology. His research focuses on the role of landscape structure in shaping insect plant interactions in working landscapes. He's the author of over 145 peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters and over 50 extension bulletins. He's also won numerous awards for his work, including being named a fellow of the Entomological Society of America, receiving the Distinguished Scientist Award from the International Organization for Biological Control, and the Recognition Award in Entomology by the Entomological Society of America for outstanding contributions to agriculture. Uh, before we launch into their studies and experiences on roadside mowing, which I know we're all excited to hear, um, let me give some additional context. Um, as in the title of this webinar, um, we are focusing on um, mowing and impacts to monarch butterflies specifically. And as I'm sure many of you are well aware, uh, populations of monarch butterflies have been steeply declining over the last several decades. The eastern population of monarchs in North America has declined by 80 to 90% over the last 20 years. And other pollinators like native bees and honeybees are also seeing um, such declines. One of the primary causes is the lack of habitat resources, both nectar resources for feeding and host plants and nesting sites for breeding. 
there are a number of strategies and initiatives that have been created, um, especially over the last several years, trying to address these declines. So for instance, in 2015, the White House, White House issued the National Strategy to Promote the Health of Honeybees and Other Pollinators. And then also more recently, there is a Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy, um, which is nearing finalization this year, as well as a similar strategy being developed in the Western United States. And many of these strategies and initiatives identify transportation and energy rights of way as important landscapes for habitat conservation. And additionally, this has been a strong focus um, area for the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group, where we've put a lot of attention and effort into talking about pollinator and monarch habitat. Back in April, um, the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group hosted another webinar on monarchs and roadsides that featured several ongoing research projects looking at the value of roadside habitat. So our interest with this webinar is kind of the second in a series is to dive into more detail regarding one of the primary management practices on roadsides, um, which is mowing. So our first presenter, Edward, is gonna share his study investigating the effects of mowing frequency on native plant communities. And then Stephanie will present a case study about how Illinois DOT is promoting monarch and pollinator habitat on their roadsides. And then lastly, Doug will share his research on strategically timing mowing and the impacts this has on egg laying and predation. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we'll save some time at the end for questions, but please feel free to submit them um, in your chat box as we go along. And with that, I will turn things over um, to Edward. Oh, sorry there, Edward. All right, so my talk is going to be focusing on plant community response to reduce mowing regime along highway right of way, specifically in northeast Mississippi. Some background information on some roadside maintenance include in 1950, um, right of ways were maintained with heavy herbicide and repeated mowings, very similar to golf courses. And by the 1965, a Highway Beautification Act was established um, through the Lady Bird Johnson uh, Foundation to improve visual, aesthetic, and ecological qualities to help improve right-of-ways. But by the 1970s, fuel prices had skyrocketed so high that um, Department of Transportation and mowing maintenance personnel had to seek alternatives to reduce these mowing costs. And by the mid-1970s, the Lady Bird Johnson um, established a wildflower program throughout the entire United States. By the early 1990s, the Federal Highway Administration had recognized that there was a nationwide trend toward a conservation approach, specifically along right-of-ways. In the past, right-of-way management included intensive mowing regime, um, herbicide practices, high expenditures of cost, um, urban development, agronomic uh, turf grass business, and even the spread of invasive uh, introduced species as well. With roadside disturbances, um, Mowing and road development greatly affect soil, groundwater, uh, surface hydrology, and vegetation composition. And each of these things spread and thrive um, with introduced uh, native plant, introduced plant species, mainly by mowing and having the bare ground and soil disturbance overall. A lot of in invasive plant species that we're all familiar with across the U.S., Johnson grass, Basie's grass, Chinese privet, Bahia grass, Kogon grass, kudzu here in the south, and even your Lesbides at clovers. Invasive, invasive species um, cost over $120 billion per year to help control, and even they even cause a lot of damage as well. As mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the problems with invasive plants, um, they reduce wildlife habitat, they limit biological diversity among uh, plants and environments, and they're extremely cost, costly to get rid of. And as mentioned earlier, um, there is a decline in native grasses and wildflowers, specifically along roadsides. So to help improve the quality uh, along roadsides, we kind of ask, what kind of grasses, forbs, wildflowers, and plants might come in with, it, with just a reduced mowing practice? And many studies in the past have found that 
native grasses and wildflowers, specifically andropogon, rutabecchia, helianthus, silphium, liatris, and even a lot of your milkweeds come back in with a reduced mowing regime. And this is mainly because the seed bank naturally occurs within the right-of-way habitat. So our study was to evaluate the plant community response along the highway right-of-way in northeast Mississippi under different mowing regimes. Here we are in northeast Mississippi is where the study was taking place at. We'd had 10 research plots in two different counties. Um, we compared species richness, percent coverage, percent uh, coverage within three different height categories, and we even looked at woody stem density, stems per hectare um, overall. And we tested each of these in regards to native and non-native invasive plants, three different treatments, which I'll talk about, upland and lowland riparian elevations, and even seasons and year effects to see if that was the difference. This is an example of our line methodology. We used a line transect to sample the vegetation. Um, this is a lowland area. You could see somebody's out there working. This is our upland sites, very typical, very dry, very high slopes. Um, and our lowland sites were usually uh, spanned by box culverts and even real close to uh, creeks or streams as well and very flat topography. This is a graphic representation of um, what you just saw. You have the right, the road and the right of way, um, and we sampled 100 meter or 100 feet by 100 feet square area, three different subplots with three different uh, tr treatments overall. Uh, the three treatments that we used were randomized. We had three greater than three times mowing annually in one subplot. The other subplot had one mowing annually only in November. And then the third subplot had one mowing annually only in November with supplemental wildflower seeding. The field parameters I've already kind of covered, species richness, cover, uh, woody stem density, and among seasons, elevation, and year effect overall. I used a lot of statistical analyses um, for each of our, um, each of our samples. Um, we used program R for specifically the percent coverage and the Adonis package within it. We used program SAS uh, for species richness, percent coverage within the height categories, and then the woody stem density. And we used PROC mix um, as one of the programs in, in SAS. Uh, all of our tests were significant. We tested at a level of significance of 0.05 alpha. And on to some of, my, some of, some of our results. Our native um, grasses and forbs uh, were one of the higher numbers overall. Um, here, as you can see in, in red, the natives um, were highest in most of the categories except grasses here. Um, and the two non-native uh, numbers, the grasses and legumes here, right, that I've circled in yellow, we'll talk a little bit more about them later. So that's a really exciting uh, to see so many native and um, species out there. As we tested years, um, treatments, elevations, and seasons, years, elevation, and seasons were highly significant um, within the species richness. Treatments, there was no, there was no significant um, test among each one of those. Talking about mean numbers, um, specifically native species, their numbers were highest in the reduced mode and the reduced mode seeded subplots, whereas the non-native species were highest in the mode plots. I talk about our percent coverage. Um, once again, years, seasons, and elevations were all highly significant, whereas the three treatments had no significance whatsoever. These seven uh, graphs and Agronomic grasses up here in the far right corner um, accompanied, were the only seven that we kind of pulled out from this chart. So out of 277 plant species that we detected, these seven agronomic grasses outcompeted percent coverage wise all other 270 plant species um, across years, mowing treatments, and upland and lowland uh, elevations as well, as you can see. We separated uh, the plants into different growth form categories, forbs, grasses, legumes, rushes, sedges, trees, vines, and such forth. To show a mean 
percent coverage. Uh, the Forbes had a very high, uh, relatively high mean and lowland and even upland elevations among fall and spring, but the non-native grasses had an even much higher uh, average mean, as you can see highlighted in blue. The non-native non legumes thrived heavily in the spring. Um, it didn't matter if it was upland or lowland, and they took over a lot of percentage area along the right-of-way. And the, non -na the native vines, I also wanted to highlight them. They also come into effect, and that could be for visual effects as well, um, or visual um, problems uh, potentially for, for, for driving. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the three different height categories. Um, here on the far left, we have the lowest height category. It's about 18 inches and less. The middle category is 18 to 36 inches, and then the higher category is anything above three feet. Um, the lower height category obviously um, shows a significance between the first year and the second year and fall and spring seasons. There is overlap um, due to species overlap while I was uh, conducting the line transect. So that's why the percentages are well above 100%. The upper two height categories, um, there was no significance shown as far as um, between seasons or years. Here we um, separated it out between year one and year two. It was a two-year study um, along the highway. The higher, the lower height category showed to be very, um, very unanimous among years. There didn't seem to be any kind of um, major differences between the treatments or between uplands or lowlands. You can see some variations here um, that showed a little bit of significance, but for overall, it didn't seem to be much of a significance overall. Um, very similar to the other um, tests that we ran, years, elevation, and season were very significant um, among the different height categories. But once again, treatments the three different treatments, they were the same. They basically showed no difference among each other within the three height categories. We talked about woody stem densities. Um, there's a lot of different trees and shrubs that come in um, within the right-of-ways with reduced mowing. We also wanted to look at that. We had upwards of 44 common woody plants along the highways. And so we wanted to test to see what kind of problems they, that they could incur. Um, from year one to year two, there was an increase. Um, as you know, if you stop mowing, uh, woody plants are gonna come in, uh, usually with vengeance. Um, but, but the main one that we, wanna, that we wanna focus on is, I took the 10 most common woody plant species, trees, shrubs, and vines, and I charted them out based off of their area uh, that we sampled. And these vines over here on the far right whether they were native or non-native, obviously they, they doubled in size or they doubled in quantity from year one to year two, but they're vines. Vines are low-lying, they creep along the ground, they're not really gonna get up to very high within the, um, the vegetation category. I know trees and shrubs, of course, can, can obstruct vision um, as far as, far as um, for driving, but this was kind of a, a key point right here that these vines, even though they doubled and tripled in size from year one to year two, um, they're not obstructing visual, um, visual driving. Similar to in the past with the other tests, um, but this is kind of an opposite one, we found no effects whatsoever among years, treatments, or elevation, but I highlighted these, these four, um, or these five here in green. They're not significant, I just wanted to mention that, but elevation and years, showed a very similar uh, trend in the predicted direction of uh, the way we tested. And so even though there was no statistical difference between the woody stem densities, native and non-native, among the years, treatments, and elevation, the years and elevation showed a similar a trend toward being significant. So just to kind of kind of wrap up um, what we did and what we found, native forbs and grasses increased three to five times among the plots, mainly in the reduced mowing reduced mode and reduced mode seeded plots. The height of vegetation did not differ m among treatments and there was no detectable um, treatment effects on woody plant stem densities. The non-native agronomic grasses, those seven that I kind of charted out at the very beginning, they accompanied, they were a, 
they had less than 5% of the total species detected, but they dominated over 90% of the coverage in all treatment areas over the two years. This is actually kind of positive. Um, the agronomic grass coverage are very beneficial for ground cover and soil stabilization, mainly along roadsides. Um, by mowing once per year during the late fall, we found that it improved native wildflowers and native grass species, mainly in the lowlands, but also in the uplands as well. The lowlands were mainly because of the higher flood um, due to the box, box covers. There was no compromise of the agronomic grass coverage, which is good for erosion control, and the woody stem density height did not increase, um, the trees and the shrubs did not increase uh, in the reduced mode subplots. And this right here, as I mentioned, could be a concern for uh, motorists or even DOTs, but it was not a concern, it wasn't a, a problem. The importance uh, that we found is why mow so often? Um, basically, if you mow once versus three times, it found the same uh, amount of species. Uh, it, it found actually better species in the one mode per year, and the vegetation as far as woody stems, trees, and shrubs did not increase. And this could also be a benefit to um, DOTs as far as cost savings as well. Um, Overall, with the reduced mode regime, it enhances the native plant communities, which is very beneficial for insects, um, butterflies, and such forth. This type of proactive management can have basic monetary savings um, while enhancing the roadside um, beauty. These benefits can also be um, accompanied without reduced visibility for motorists. And mainly what we're talking about is the 15 meters um, from the roadside edge out to 15 meters continually be mowed, but beyond that 15 meters to be left on a one-year rotation mowing. Obviously, future studies still need to be going on um, to across different phys physiographic regions, uh, maybe even a longer study, and even other treatment options can even be um, studied in the future to see if your re region or your your state could be um, you know a benefit from these from these research. I definitely want to thank all these people here on this uh, this last slide. Um, Mississippi Department of Transportation funded the R project, and they were very instrumental in helping us uh, throughout this project. And Mississippi State University as well. Great. That's all okay. I have. Thank you very much, Edward. Thank I'm going to transition over to um, Stephanie here. Um, and again, Stephanie will be talking about the um, Illinois Department of Transportation and their work um, with Operation Pollinator Habitat. So Stephanie, take it away. Thank you, Iris. Um, and thanks for that nice lead-in to explain my anecdotal <laughs> evidence. Had I known five years ago or four years ago, um, how important milkweed would be to me today, uh, I would have had a lot more documented uh, evidence. Uh-oh, can't make my slides go, Iris. Um, try, try clicking on the slide first and then advancing. Okay, I got it, sorry. Okay, there you go. Okay, so a little background on Illinois, because I know we have people on the line that's from all over the place. So Illinois is a very tall state. We're 390 miles north to south, and we're 210 miles from side to side. So it's a very wide state. It's made up of um, 57,000 uh, square miles, average elevation 600 feet. Um, we're continental climate, so we have large temperature fluctuations uh, really all year long. Um, we're not controlled by uh, oceans or mountains. We're smack dab in the middle. Uh, this slide here, you can see how the state is divided up within the DOT. Um, and right up, oop, sorry. Right here, that is Champaign County right there on the D5. So I'll make some references to that later when we start talking, when I start talking about our milkweed densities and what we're seeing happen um, with the changes in our, in our mowing. Um, anyway, our structure is, as you see here, we have nine districts. Um, I'm at the central office. The central office 
pushes out policy and assists the districts, but they manage their own labor forces. All of our mowing is um, done in-house with the exception of District 1, which is up here near Chicago. They do have some uh, contract mowing uh, just because of the urbanized area. Um, we, uh, sorry. So why why would a state DOT be worried about the potential listing of the monarch butterfly? Um, as you heard on the previous slide, uh, federal government has a responsibility with um, the presidential memorandum and right, we are controlled and governed somewhat by the FHWA, we're federally funded. Um, along with that, we have a responsibility to do environmental clearances for our projects. Uh, when we have an endangered species, that process is very lengthy. So it would add significant time to our review of projects to get them out the door, to do the construction and maintain the roads like we need to do. Additionally, since the monarch goes every place it wants to go, um, and here's the reference, the heat map, and you see Illinois right here in the middle, um, we are in a very critical zone for the monarch. So generally everything that we have out there um, would become habitat. So every time we needed to encroach on the grass, more or less, we would need to do an environmental um, review, which is not practical. Um, when I first heard about the monarch uh, being listed, I was like, oh my, we have to start doing something. So I dug in and started doing the research and figuring out what we can do and how can we do this. And um, the rest of the story here today just evolved from that point on. Operation Habitat um, was created and so named as our departmental push to uh, crank out information to the public um, and others internally and externally into our partners, our counties, and we have townships also in Illinois. Our counties are governed and maintained by county highway departments and our townships, smaller roads are maintained by townships and they have their own governance structure. So we don't maintain or um, control policy and what happens on those roads. So there's a need to push that information on out. The department, we have roughly 339,000 acres. There is 1.2 million acres of rights of way in the state of Illinois. So very small amount that we actually control within our forces. So um, we launched Operation Habitat. It's for public outreach and internal and external education. And um, we have handouts and other things that go along with this. Down here in the, in the bottom right, that's one of our seed packets. We partnered with our Department of Natural Resources and um, produce these seed packets and give those out at various locations, public events, so on and so forth. Um, beginning in last year, we pushed out a modified mowing policy that reduced our mowing to only 15 foot which is the safety strip along the edge of the roadway. Um, 15 foot's not a magical number. That's how wide our mowers are. So we reduced that mowing to 15 foot. What I had observed, and I showed the back there where Champaign County was, beginning in 2015 in Champaign County, um, we simply started managing for milkweed by not mowing it, mowing around it, and adjusted our spraying herbicide use to much earlier in the season um, and by making only those changes and again I do not have the data I wish I did <laughs> by making only those small changes milkweed uh, populations went crazy um, since then and after so prior to changing policy last year we did milkweed stem density counts in Champaign County and then Sangamon County which is in the middle of the state and East West ge um, geographically on the same uh, line. In Sangamon County, where milkweed or where mowing had been done completely, the whole right of way was mowed multiple times a year, two to three times a year they mowed to the fence. So all of the interstate right of way was, was mowed versus Champaign County, where we had been managing for then three years. Um, those stem densities in Sangamon County, where it was constantly mowed 
and it was primarily common milkweed, we had about 40 stems per acre. In Champaign County, where we'd been only for three years managing for milkweed, those stem densities were over a thousand stems per acre. Additionally, we saw other things, um, aster, ironweed, other species uh, returning with the change in management style. After we issued our policy, and as I said, we don't directly govern the counties, but in passing around through the state, it was obvious that several of the counties had changed. So we polled the counties, approximately one third of the counties also modified their mowing practices to some extent in beginning in 2017. And then we started seeing this. You can, that's our road on the right. And you can see farmer has mowed next to his crops. I would like him to mow less than he did, <laughs> but he didn't mow it all the way out. Past practice would have been to mow that all the way out to the edge of the road. Um, and then you can see right here on the, on the right where that arrow is pointing to, that is a milkweed plant and there were eggs on it. So that monarch egg there would have gone to adulthood providing it wasn't attacked by something else, but it would have been left there um, to mature without being mowed by, by us or the private property owner. But what about the brush? So um, we know we have mulberry, autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, Russian olive, very aggressive shrub, shrub species that just get huge even sometimes over a year or two of not mowing. Um, primarily why we did so much mowing um, was to control the brush. So we had to come up with a strategy to control the brush, not let the brush come back in, um, especially in those counties and districts where there was a lot of mowing previously and that right of way was clear and didn't really have any brush. So save mowing is strategically applied vegetation exemption and it allows the districts on rural interstates to mow more than the 15 foot, primarily for brush control and to mimic burning. We can't burn on the federal highway system. There's just not enough room and it's too dangerous with all of the traffic that we have. So this is a brief description of what save mowing looks like on this top slide, or this top line up here, was roughly what we had that was existing. Um, the second slide, that's what we need it to look like. Does it in reality? No, we never get quite to there. It looks a little bit more like what we have down here in year one. Save mowing is basically a crop rotation format or style of mowing. We will continue to mow, the, and this what you're seeing from here down is the progression over three years. So this is year one, we'll mow the 15 foot safety strip, we'll mow 15 foot near the fence and we'll leave that habitat, habitat strip in the middle. Year two, We'd hold off the fence 15 foot here, mow that strip and, and the safety strip and leave two habitat strips. And then in the third year, we'd hold off 30 feet and mow everything else. Um, seems busy and confusing. Our folks in the field also think it's busy and confusing. We tried it last year on cycle one. Um, one of the benefits that we saw, because we're in the Midwest, one of the benefits that we saw was we also got snow holding. Um, with that first cycle mowing, and we expect to see that throughout the districts and the district roadside managers. Once they enter into save mowing program, there's constant monitoring and touching up and keeping that access control fence clear of the brush so that you're not introducing those invasives right back into your plots. Um, and it, it does take more monitoring. Uh, hopefully they're not out there mowing so they have more time to do that. <laughs> This year in 2018, based on what we learned last year with the reduced mowing, um, we modified policy and we added in um, provisions to mow around our assets on first cycle mowing. We'll mow for our traffic uh, assets, which is our controller boxes, um, traffic control features, stuff that's generally placed over towards the right of way. We put out a schematic on how to do that. That'll happen on first cycle. On second cycle, We'll mow for our box culverts, crossroad culverts, things like that. Two reasons. One, they need to be visually um, 
no noticeable to anybody out there using the right of way, our forces or our construction folks, if the grass is tall or the forbs are tall and they don't see that box culvert, they may fall off into it and fall over into it, but also to control the woody um, brush and the invasives to make sure that those box culver culverts are easily identifiable. This year, we will do more save mowing on a wider scale across the state. Um, these two photos right here, this is a prairie that was planted in 2016, the larger picture. And that small picture down there is the a median section up on Interstate 39. And a lot of that white that you see in there is world milkweed. And because we have some very wide medians on our interstate system, um, and we do have presence of milkweed, um, this year we removed our, inter our medians um, from the mowing cycle, and we will only mow the 15 foot on medians larger than, wider than 40 feet. Um, the districts have the option if there's going to be a snow drifting problem, they would mow out in those areas where there's snow drifting, snow drifting issues. Um, to counterbalance our mowing, we will do additional mowing on the two lane and our primary routes this year to control the brush on those. Then next year we'll return and on final mowing, we'll mow out those median areas um, on final mowing. So we are making an effort, a, a very concerted effort, to transition from mowing as our primary method of vegetation management to utilizing mowing as a tool for vegetation management. Um, we are observing increase in milkweed, native forbs all across the state. Uh, we expect that education, both to the public and internally, will continue indefinitely. Um, there's going to be changes I, I teach on our mowing policy and practices is a moving target um, based on what we see and how that vegetation reacts. Plus, as I mentioned, we're a very tall state. So um, what works in at the West Compton border is not going to work down south at the very southern tip of our, of our state. We also partner with um, multiple groups, Pheasants Forever, Illinois Farm Bureau, that has evolved with this uh, monarch project and uh, that just what you have all observed, how everyone is working together and those have been fantastic partnerships for us. So in conclusion, um, integrated vegetation management requires the use of a full toolbox of management strategies, including strategic and properly timed use of herbicides, constant monitoring, evaluation and reevaluation. You can't just do one thing and walk away from it. Adequate funding and resources, manpower, contracts, whatever is needed to manage appropriately at the appropriate time. Education both in with internal staff and the public. They are used to seeing things a certain way, so it's very different from the public what we're doing now. And properly timed mowing. Mowing is not the only tool in the toolbox. So that is something that we are having to learn and that anybody to be successful, you're going to have to take advantage of, of everything that you have in that toolbox. But trying to teach that mowing is not the only tool uh, is challenging, but we are seeing great success. So that's all I have, Iris. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, we will move on then to our uh, final speaker, um, Doug Landis. So Doug, I'm giving you control here. I'll advance the slide. And just before you get started, Doug, um, just a friendly reminder um, to our audience that as you have questions, please continue to put them in the chat box and we will address them at the end. Okay. Take it away, Doug. Great. Thanks, Iris. This has been a great webinar so far. Uh, <clears throat> really interesting ideas about mowing, and I hope to add some some further thoughts to that on uh, in this presentation on can we manage rights of way to actually enhance uh, butterfly and pollinator habitat at the same time. As Iris has already pointed out, both monarchs and other pollinators have been in decline. Monarch butterflies have declined by 80% or more in the last 20 years. Um, managed honeybees, uh, managed by apiculturalists, have also declined, and colony losses are commonly now exceeding 40% per year, uh, which greatly exceeds the 15% that, that um, beekeepers consider normal losses. And in addition to the managed bee losses, wild bees have also declined across a significant portion of uh, the U.S. land area. So I'm going to talk about um, all of these, but I'm going to first focus on the monarch butterfly 
And, uh, but habitat loss is a major contributor in all of these cases. So just to reorient you to the biology of the monarch butterfly, uh, monarch butterflies right now are present throughout, um, throughout North America. Uh, the adults lay eggs on uh, various species of milkweeds. There's probably a dozen or so species of milkweeds that uh, they can lay eggs on which the larva can develop on. The one shown here in the upper right is common milkweed, Asclepius riaca, uh, which is the most common milkweed, the most abundant milkweed in our uh, part of the world in the North Central region. Those eggs hatch, they become larvae. The first instar is about a millimeter long, so very tiny. Uh, what's pictured here is a fifth instar, the ones that you're maybe more typically going to see. Um, very large, colorful um, uh, warning coloration in both the adults and larvae to warn uh, uh, potential predators that they could be toxic. Those, uh, those caterpillars then uh, pupate in a chrysalis and uh, form the adult form, which repeats the cycle several times. You may also know that this butterfly undergoes this tremendous transcontinental migration. So butterflies from Canada actually fly 3,000 miles or so uh, to the central highlands of Mexico, where they overwinter uh, in very distinct spots in oromel tree, uh, fir forests, where they form these large aggregations on the, on the trees, and they use that for thermal regulation uh, during the winter. Then in the spring, those very same adults fly back into the southern region, uh, pictured here in orange, uh, they lay eggs on a variety of milkweeds, undergo their first generation in the south, then they fly northward into both the north central and the northeast region. And this population of monarchs is called the eastern migratory population. There's also a non-migratory population in Florida and a western migratory population as well. But I'm going to concentrate my thoughts on the, uh, on the eastern migratory population. And uh, previously, we had shown uh, where uh, monarch habitat is, uh, or where mo most monarchs uh, are being bred. And basically, it corresponds to the corn belt of, uh, of north central region. So about 50% of the butterflies that make their way back to Mexico are believed to be uh, born in the corn belt, and 95% in this larger north central and northeastern region. So this region is very important uh, for, for those um, insects, but it has undergone tremendous landscape change uh, in the last uh, several hundred years. Previously, the Corn Belt uh, was mostly tall grass prairie uh, with, uh, with the disturbance regime that, of fire and large animal grazing that persisted there. But then uh, in the 1800s, it was converted largely into agriculture. Um, it was still suitable habitat for monarchs, though, in the most throughout most of the 20th century. So when farming was farmers were limited to using cultivation or uh, or less effective herbicides, uh, common milkweed was readily found within most corn and soybean fields. It was quite common to find milkweed uh, growing in amongst the crop plants, and because of the continual disturbance, you also found a, a wide variety of phenological stages. You would find some uh, milkweeds that were quite small and tender and uh, good food for monarchs and others that were older. However, in the last 20 years or so, with the advent of more effective herbicides and specifically herbicide-resistant corn and soybean crops, uh, farmers have been able to almost completely eliminate milkweeds from the crop fields. So milkweeds still persist in field margins, rights of way, um, but uh, not within the tens of millions of acres of uh, cropland where it formerly existed. So it's been estimated that, that there's been a 58% decline in common milkweed in the Midwest, and that if one were to want to replace that in order to, uh, to provide similar habitat, uh, it's estimated that we would need to plant 1.3 to 1.6 billion stems uh, in the U.S. to offset that loss. So a tremendous task. But it actually gets worse. Um, we didn't just lose a billion stems. But it turns out that the stems that remain are not as suitable for milkweeds for two reasons. Um, milk monarchs really like to lay eggs on very young plants, plants with three, four leaves on them, well before they flower and certainly long before they uh, senesce and produce pods. And uh, we have, uh, by not disturbing these uh, areas, uh, we tend to get similar phenology of milkweed plants, which are suitable for the first generation of milk of monarchs in Michigan, uh, but then rapidly become unsuitable for the second and third generations. Uh, in addition, uh, wherever you have milkweed growing in a grassland habitat, 
there are much higher numbers of predators than there are when it was formerly growing in uh, disturbed cropland habitats. And our lab has, um, and others have uh, been looking at predation and uh, ants, earwigs, lady beetles, spiders, crickets, grasshoppers, actually we have about 30 species that we now know uh, will readily eat uh, monarch eggs and uh, early instars, particularly the first uh, instars. And it's estimated that um, maybe only two to five out of 100, so 95 to 98% mortality of, uh, of monarch eggs and larvae is considered common. So what can we do about that? We, we asked the question, can we increase monarch egg laying and larval survival in existing habitats, uh, habitats that we already have? And furthermore, can we develop management practices that support monarchs and other pollinators at the same time? And sort of the genesis for this is observations I made in my front yard over the last decade or so. I've planted a prairie and around that I have an alfalfa strip that I mow as a burn break. Um, and that typically gets mowed in late May or early June. And the common observation is that milkweeds that don't happen to get mowed off uh, by mid in June, this was last week at my house, uh, are in flower. Some of them are actually beginning to senesce, so uh, less attractive. And those that were mowed off are regenerating from the rhizomes and are producing uh, uh, fresh new foliage, which uh, every one of the orange flags is an, uh, a milkweed which has had an egg laid on it. Uh, there's the tiny uh, egg laid on that very small plant. Uh, so this, I've seen this for years happening, and I wondered if we could do a more strategic job of actually managing that mowing uh, and how it seems to create more suitable habitat. So I created what I called the Mowing for Monarchs experiment. We did this at eight locations on a pilot basis in 2017, and we expanded it to 15 sites this year. Uh, basically, these are roadsides. Uh, we worked with our DOT in 2017. Um, or other grassland areas where common milkweed exists in a, in a matrix typically of cool season grasses. Um, we select areas that have both, uh, that have milkweed divided into three uh, sections and randomly assign one as control, one to be mowed in mid-June and one to be mowed in mid-July. And at this experimental level, the mowing is me and a, a brush blade on a weed whacker, uh, but it's quite effective at rapidly uh, mowing down that vegetation. So we mow them in mid-June because that is when the unmowed uh, milkweed is just beginning to flower. And then we mow in July because that's when the June mowed milkweed is just beginning to flower. So we're trying to continually create vegetative uh, state milkweed for, uh, for monarchs. And the results from 2017 were quite promising in unmowed controls, which are shown here in brown. Uh, we actually find very few eggs being laid. Monarchs really don't like uh, in this mid to late season, uh, they do not prefer to lay eggs in uh, unmowed milkweed. Uh, where we have mowed a portion of that uh, plant plot in June uh, and then started monitoring for eggs several weeks later, uh, we get about double the number of eggs that we had in the unmowed control. And when we mow in uh, mid-July and then begin monitoring, we get about tenfold more eggs uh, eggs and first instars uh, on those stems that are regenerating. So clearly we can uh, increase oviposition um, by the, the female monarchs. We also have the effect of reducing predator density. So turns out that milkweed plants are really covered in predators most of the time. Every time we look at a plant, we record what predators are there, and this could be ants or lady beetles or spiders, um, and put on a per hundred stem basis, there's uh, 200 to 300 predators uh, per, uh, per hundred stems, so two to three predators per stem on average uh, throughout in unmowed uh, areas. Uh, while when we mow it, we tend to create a, at least a period of time for about four weeks where, predation, where predator numbers are lower, uh, and that happens again in the uh, July mowing. And this is primarily because the predators are really not there because of monarchs. Monarch eggs are not dense enough to really attract predators, but the predators are there mostly because of the aphids that, that milkweed supports. And when we mow it, we set back the aphid populations uh, and it takes a while for the aphids to build back up and it takes a while for predators to find it. So ecologists call this uh, enemy-free space. We're creating a little enemy-free or reduced enemy space for the monarch uh, eggs and larvae to hatch and survive. So the second part of this, um, 
experiment or uh, complementary experiment, we're trying to combine uh, monarch and pollinator habitat in uh, in one uh, sort of management practice that could be uh, potentially adopted. We have a long history of uh, surveying and screening native plants for their attractiveness to natural enemies and, and pollinators. And so we have a deep knowledge of what native plants bloom at what time of year uh, in various conditions in Michigan. And so we're incorporating those native plants to provide pollen and nectar for natural enemies and uh, pollinators, uh, but also to provide nectar for um, for adult monarchs that need that to fuel their, their flight. We're actually tilling these plots to start them, um, and that helps reduce ants and other predators, and then we're strategically mowing them uh, as well to increase their attractiveness. And this is what one of these plots looks like last week. Uh, this is actually a six species of flowering plants surrounding uh, common milkweed growing down the center of the plot. Uh, this entire area was tilled and these were planted from uh, seedlings in 2017. So you can see that they grow quite rapidly. Um, we have plants that will flower throughout the season in this, uh, in this mix. And we're also testing higher diversity mixtures with 12 species of flowering plants. Um, we then um, Doug, it sounds like your audio may have cut out. Uh, but overall, the 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 practice seems to be working quite well. Back in uh, late uh, May, we found by surveying these common milkweed stems. Yes, I think my connection is back now. We have uh, we found 81 monarch larvae on 1,700 stems. That's 4.6 larvae per 100 stems. While that may sound low, that's actually 15-fold greater than we have ever found in any typical grassland. And uh, about uh, three quarters of them were fifth instars, meaning that they had already survived much of the predation and mortality, and were well on their way to becoming butterflies. So it looks like. Um, this combination of using tillage and uh, coupling that with other plants, uh, with flowering plants, might be uh, quite successful. Just finally, what we're doing here this year is we are uh, counting all the pollinators that are attracted to this plant, these plants, uh, now that they're blooming in their normal phenology, and we'll be uh, reporting that information. So just to wrap up, um, we're repeating our mowing and monarch habitat studies, and we'll be publishing those uh, at the end of the season here. Doug, I think your audio might have cut out again. Are you there? Have many other things to that you're using mowing for, and you may have restricted mowing dates due to grassland bird nesting habitat, etc. So something like this could be incorporated into work that you already do. Yeah, with that, I will. Uh, I also seem to have lost control of the. There it is. With that, I'll hand it back to Iris. Okay, thank you so much, Doug. And I can I can advance it back to your slide there if you want for your acknowledgement. Um, okay, great. Well, um, thanks again to Edward, Stephanie, and Doug um, for your great presentations. I think we covered a lot um, in our short hour here, um, but we do have a little bit of time here at the end for some questions. Um, so as a reminder, um, please type any questions you have into the chat box. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions for um, Edward and Stephanie. Um, and as you think of questions for Doug, again, um, please add, um, add them to the chat box. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get through all the questions today, so I'll try to mm -hmm. highlight um, some of the priority ones. Um, and then we'll follow up with you afterwards if we didn't get to your question. Um, so the first question, um, I'll give this one to Edward. Um, based on your research, did you see a change in mowing practices in Mississippi? Yes, I did. Um, it took approximately four years from the time that my study was uh, conducted and, and had its final results, um, and also with lots of policy um, from state and federal governments, 
Um, and then also the big push with the monarch uh, decline uh, in the past several years, um, there has been mowing practices reduced in the state of Mississippi as of spring 2018. So it, it's taken some time, but um, they're starting to get on board as well, yes. Great, okay, thanks Edward. Um, Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about um, how you have trained um, the mowers or the maintenance folks um, so, they, so that they know what to mow and what to leave alone? Well, it's a challenge for sure. Um, each of the nine districts has a roadside maintenance manager, and they've been attending. So each county yard basically has a mowing meeting um, prior to the beginning of the season. Uh, multiple folks attend that, and our roadside managers have been attending those meetings just to talk to each of those. It's very time consuming to make sure that they understand it, um, pushing out other educational materials, uh, pictures, diagrams, like the save mowing diagram that you saw there. So it's a challenge, and uh, I don't think that we do it as well as I certainly would like to, um, but it's an, it's an ongoing and a constant effort to um, stop and visit, touch base with those guys, and then on my part and the roadsides, once mowing begins, all throughout the mowing cycle and seasons, um, we follow up and just travel around and check the roads and kind of make sure that they're mowing as they're supposed to and if they're not stop and ask and uh so far that's been pretty successful okay great um and a piggyback to that um, question is in terms of tracking we had a couple of questions related to um, using gis um, or other tracking mechanisms to monitor um, your success and how the program and habitat is developing just this winter uh, we created an app or an interface through uh, collector in GIS. And again, my roadside, there's nine of them. They're out working on that collecting. We are collecting two things, really, um, our restored habitat area, so stuff that's not already in our native prairie databases. So we're cl collecting our restored areas and our newly constructed habitat areas. And then um, nearly the same app, but we're collecting uh, weed areas, so where areas where we have high infestations of invasives and noxious weeds, we're collecting those as well. We are not um, pushing out GIS information to our districts yet. We've just begun that with our snow plowing operation um, in one district, and a couple more districts are coming on this winter. Once those evolve, and what I'm, and so that we have that coverage statewide, what I'm preparing for is by the time that happens, we'll have those GIS maps um, in each mower or each truck or each sprayer so they can see what they need to do. So behind the scenes, we're building that information and then just this week launched one for vegetation management and mowing mapping. So yes, we are using it. It is not uh, complete by any means at this point, but that's the direction we're heading. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then also, Stephanie, um, a question about um, your herbicide use. Um, have you considered adjusting um, you know, herbicide management practices or application timing um, as part of, again, some of these habitat efforts that you have? Um, and then related to that, um, any concerns from adjacent landowners, particularly the farming community? Yes, we have adjusted our herbicide use, both in timing of application. We've moved it considerably earlier than we normally would before the warm season and the forbs are, have emerged, um, have had good luck with that. Um, the challenge that causes is the woody vegetation that we would also spray the woody volunteers is also not leafed out. Um, so we've had to do some more spot type treating in the fall um, to catch those woody plants. Um, we've also adjusted the amount of herbicide and um, the type of herbicide. So we're using um, milestone, plateau, things like that, that um, some of our native herbs have some resistance to, and primarily milkweed does. Um, it, we see some action on the milkweed, but it does not kill it. Um, and then local adjacent property owners and landowners, that's part of our ongoing education process. Yes, there's concern. Um, I handle those and so do my roadside managers on a case-by-case -case basis. And sometimes it means a lengthy telephone conversation to explain why we're doing what we're doing. Um, 
and or a trip out there or whatever. And we also lean heavily on our Farm Bureau partners, Illinois Corn partners, to help us with that part of it as well. And they're they're also um, through their part of Illinois Monarch Project pushing out that information. Most of the farmers are aware, um, but yes, that that is a challenge. Okay, thank you. Um, and Doug, I know you were having some audio issues there at the end, um, but if you could um, respond to this question um, regarding timing. Um, so we had a question that mowing dates um, would assume to be varied by location. Um, where is a good resource for people to get imp more information about the optimal timing um, for mowing in their locality? Doug, it looks like you might be muted. Okay, I wasn't sure if that question was for me because I missed the first part. I keep losing my audio. Oh, um, okay. I'm sorry. Um, where would you get additional information? Where would one get additional yeah. information about optimal timing for mowing? I think that's probably not uni uniformly available yet. Uh, you know, this is really just research that we're conducting now. Um, I think what you'd want to do would be to think about uh, the local milkweed species that you are managing and their suitability for um, for monarchs at the time the monarchs are moving through your area. So it will vary greatly uh, as they move into that first generation breeding area and then up into the more northern areas. For common milkweed, I feel reasonably confident that I would say mowing when it hits first flower, mowing about a third of the plants in a patch when it hits first flower might be a good rule of thumb to to uh, go by. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I also know that Monarch Joint Venture um, has some resources available, um, again, broadly um, identifying some mowing um, timeframes um, throughout mm -hmm. the US. So that might be another helpful resource for people as well. Yes, and those, those are actually uh, oftentimes focused on avoiding mowing at times when monarchs are present in habitat. And that's obviously important. Um, what we have found is that there are so few monarchs present in the habitat um, when we are mowing that it's really not a concern. So I think it's an evolving, uh, an evolving question. Okay, great. Well, I know there's a number of questions um, that we didn't have a chance to get to um, with our time today. So uh, we will follow up with you individually. Um, and you know, put you in touch with the appropriate um, presenter to help answer your questions. Um, I believe uh, Edward, Stephanie, and Doug have all indicated they'd be willing to take questions um, following today's webinar. So as you have questions, um, feel free to send them um, to me, Iris Caldwell, um, and I can forward on um, the questions as needed. So again, a huge thank you to our presenters today um, for sharing their um, ex expertise and experiences um, mowing in, in these different um, environments. And thank you all for attending. Um, one last reminder, we will be posting a recording of this webinar um, to our website, um, and we'll send out an email um, when that recording is available. So with that, thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>